Welcome everybody. We're just at 11 o'clock, so I think we'll start our webinar for today. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, the Diversity in Polar Science Initiative is delighted that Dr. Salt can join us to speak with us today during Black History Month. I'm going to introduce Dr. Salt and then she will speak for about half an hour. After that, we will have questions and answers. If you have a question, can you please uh, type it into the question and answer box. If you have an issue with this, um, please try and indicate through that, that question and answer box and we'll try and talk to you. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Salt um, and we're looking forward to the talk very much. So Dr. Karen Salt is a leading figure in the area of diversity and inclusion in UK research and has over 26 years worth of experience working in and with communities organisations, charities and governmental bodies, including running nonprofits and engaging in community development work. She is an expert on sovereignty, power, collective activism and systems of government. She has led and collaborated on a number of research projects, many of which explore participatory democracy, trust and collective governance. She is a former member of the Arts and Humanities Research Council Advisory Board and continues to contribute to UK and international conversations about transformational social justice and institutional change. Dr. Salt, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and thank you to the folks I can't see. I, I know you're there. I, I, there. There are numbers somewhere on this screen that tell me that there are that there are people with us um, from, I would, I would imagine, around the world in, in vastly different sets of circumstances um, uh, who found time in their day uh, to, to kind of sit and kind of walk with me for a bit. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you for giving me a bit of your time. Um, and uh, I, hope, I hope what I share today can both, um, can I help you reflect on your own world, uh, can inspire you, uh, however it, it, it may, um, but also I think uh, kind of open up some space for a conversation, uh, which is what I hope we will have um, towards the end of, uh, of the lecture. Um, so I've, I've, I've suggested that I want to talk about, um, uh, you know, what is it like to be a, a kind of lead researcher and to, and to be um, an investigator? And what is it like to go on this kind of journey? Um, and I could talk, start to talk with a whole bunch of things about what I've been funded by and, and who and the projects and the various things and, um, and publications, uh, but I, I don't, I don't want to start there. Um, in, in classic form, <laughs> um, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna go back uh, a while. Um, and actually take you to um, a little black girl growing up in Florida um, and, uh, and, and what her experiences were like. Um, so uh, that, that little black girl is me, just in case anyone uh, thinks I'm, I'm, I'm just being euphemistic about somebody else. Uh, this is me. Um, uh, and when I, when I grew up in, in Florida, some of you might have been to Florida, you might know where it is on the map, uh, you might you might assume that you you know what Florida is, uh, Disney World and beaches and various other things. Um, so that that was in the Florida that I grew up in. But um, uh, and I I grew up on the, the southwest coast um, uh, of Florida, and um, uh, nowhere near a beach, <laughs> uh, and unfortunately nowhere near Disney World, uh, which was a, a single road that you drove into a forest and you parked when I grew up. Um, uh, and uh, quite a lot of Florida uh, for a long time, and even still now, is agricultural based. Um, uh, and so the community that I grew up in is a town near an actual town that has the same name. Um, and in fact, when, when I would say my town's name and people would go, oh yes, I've been there to go golfing, I would go, you've never been to the town that I grew up in uh, because I grew up in a black community that was on the outskirts of that other town. Um, this was a community quite, quite poor. Um, most folks were originally involved in agriculture in some capacity. Um, the town grew in size, uh, would eventually end up with uh, religious institutions. It would have its own schools. It would have its own businesses. Um, it, was a, it was a vital center. And it was the space where I really learned about community activism and coming together because almost everyone didn't 
Um, uh, while there were some people who worked in the, the town I grew up in, most had to leave to go to the other cities to work um, and, to, and, to, and, to, and to interact. Um, and, I, and I noticed all of this as a, as a, as a young black girl um, and, and noticed the ravages on, on my community, um, the influx of huge amounts of, um, of drugs uh, and, um, and, and the challenges that people had. But this little black girl, um, uh, from that particular part of, uh, of, of the community um, and where I lived meant that going to school, um, I was marked uh, and I was, I was actually tagged in the educational system uh, to which then I would uh, be um, uh, recognized as kind of being behind. Um, and that actually was uh, my experience um, uh, up until probably, I don't know, somewhere around nine or 10 or 11. Um, and I could score anything I wanted to do on any kind of standardized test, uh, but because of the, the sort of postcode, if you will, of, of where I lived um, and, and where I was based, uh, I, 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 was, I was automatically put into remedial courses and automatically put into spaces where, uh, where it, was, it was just really quite hard to sort of um, find your voice and find yourself uh, within, within this education system. Um, and then there's this magical, magical moment. So there's this particular year it's not, a, it's not any kind of special year, but um, uh, I'm in secondary school and, um, and I had these kind of experiences and, uh, um, and I go into my math class and I'm sitting there in the math class and I get the book and I start working on things and, and, and I, had, I had an epiphany and I don't know essentially why I had this epiphany, but um, I'd gone home and we were supposed to do the homework and I did the homework and, um, and I just got, I wasn't really quite bored, but I turned the page and I started reading the next bit of stuff. And I was like, hmm, I did that work too. I turned another page, I read what I was, and then I did that one. And I, I did the entire chapter and I was like, this is cool. So I didn't do anything in 21. I kept it kind of quiet, um, but I kept moving along, doing these sorts of chapters and, and, and finishing various bits of work. Um, and my teacher finally kind of cottons on in class and, um, and she's like, you know, what are you doing? What's, what's, what's happening? And I'm just like, well, I've actually finished uh, by that point, something like five or six chapters. Um, and she's just, she's completely convinced that I haven't done this. Um, and, then, and, and to the point where she's looking to see like, did the book get leave her desk? And where's, where's the, how did I find all these answers? So she double checks my work, realizes that it's all fine. And then she gives me the tests on all the chapters. So I take the tests. I, I get hundred percent on all of them. And at some point you would imagine that she's probably kind of cottoned on, right? No, no. Um, I'm just a kind of perplexion. So she kind of let me keep going for a little while um, just to see what might happen. And, and I was a bit quiet about what was happening with my mom and telling her and various things. And um, I finished the whole book. Uh, I am now tested uh, throughout the entire, the, the, the entire text. And then I take the kind of end of, your, end of your text. And then the teacher it just doesn't know what to do with me. Um, uh, and so I went to the back of the room and there were these boxes in the back that had these like small cards with math questions on them. And for the rest of the year, I did those boxes. All of my colleagues uh, went, and, you know, they were doing work, they were working together. And I was this solitary person in the back of the class with this box moving my way through it. Um, and it had a profound effect on me because I, di I didn't realize at the time what my superpower was. My superpower was patterns, right? I, I could read and understand these sets of patterns um, and, and, and how to work my way through them. But I didn't really understand any of that. I just understood that math was really cool and, um, and it made sense to me. Um, so eventually I tell my mother um, who, who went and raised a ruckus at school um, uh, and event eventually ended up bringing in a, a colleague of hers who was a friend of hers um, and, um, and they fought tooth and nail for the next year to get me into um, the, the next level of math. Um, and so uh, when, when the school year started, I was in the advanced class and it was like I've been dropped into Mars. So I went from remedial courses to immediately moving into the courses where like all the smart kids were. 
And they all knew each other from birth or something. I don't know, but they were speaking a language I didn't understand. They were doing stuff that didn't make any sense. Um, uh, but this became my new world for, uh, for the next two years. Um, and and I, I, I understood it, but it was also, it also opened up sort of really weird opportunities. So suddenly I had like free periods and I could go in. Uh, so the day was organized in periods. I think I had seven over the day and I had a free one and I could go and like work with the biology teacher in the lab. There was all this stuff and no one explained it to me that this is the universe was still in existence when I was in the other classes. But this was this, this was this strange space suddenly and I couldn't figure out exactly how to maximize any of it, but it did look like this might be helpful. Um, so I just sort of bumbled my way along all of this um, uh, as much as I could. Um, and so I move into the kind of latter part of, of secondary school and, uh, and I'm, still, I'm still on this track, right? Um, but I haven't kind of figured myself out too much yet. Um, and I'm on this track and I, and I end up in um, uh, another math class and, uh, and, and, and I'm really enjoying this now. I'm, I'm seriously enjoying this. Uh, geometry just makes so much sense to me. Algebra is this magical space where things just like, it, it just has a purpose. Um, and, and I joined the math team and I'm actually really good at it. And, and I'm enjoying myself, just, it, it's, it's just exciting. Then I discovered the sciences. It, it literally was like, um, I, and I've been having science classes. And I, so I don't really understand what happened. But I, I took an advanced chemistry class and, and I and totally remember that teacher. Uh, and it was a ragtag group of us in this advanced chemistry class of all sorts of backgrounds. Um, and I just was like, equations. It was, just, it was this, this beautiful space um, where, where I, I just, I really found my calling. And, I, and again, I was starting to get it now. This was the superpower that I had was to see these sets of patterns and to think about systems. Um, and it made, it made so much sense. And I joined the chemistry team. And, uh, and what was really interesting about this advanced chemistry class is that there was a, there was a really advanced class uh, that was further down the, 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 the sort of hallway. Um, and, and at the chemistry competitions, my class beat them. So we, we, we started having super confidence in ourselves and what we were doing um, and essentially how we were doing it. And, and, and all of those experiences of uh, eventually joining uh, physics, which just touched my heart. Um, uh, eventually my mind was blown when I took my first earth and atmospheric sciences course where I realized, oh my gosh, there are even bigger systems. Um, and uh, and it, was, it was deeply exciting. And um, so I eventually went off to university, um, uh, uh, still thinking, you know, science was going to stay really close to me. Um, I, I saw patterns in lots of other things in linguistics um, and politics uh, because I'm, 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 I'm at heart a systems analysis. So uh, I um, an analyst. So I really, really found these sets of systems just heartening. Um, and life intervened, though. Uh, I made some babies. Um, uh, well, I, I met a person, made some babies. Um, found different career paths. Um, and it, it wasn't as if I left academia or I didn't like it, um, but I was uh, really excited about the other things I was doing. Um, uh, Donna's already told you I was leading nonprofits. I got involved in women's health. I did a lot of writing. I did a huge amount of community development work, really got involved in kind of race relations issues and, um, and, and, and spent a lot of time working with youth. Uh, who um, were dealing with a, a number of, of challenges uh, and, and, and issues, including those who were in drug treatment and, and pregnant. So I, I spent a lot of time working at the kind of front line of a lot of issues uh, um, across, a, across a wide swathe of a community. Um, and then I started doing a lot of policy work at the national and international level. And I was having a grand time. Um, uh, did it in, a, in any case, think academia was bad or good. It was, I was, I was literally uh, uh, focused on the stuff that I was doing. Um, and I, I, was, I was working on a book, um, happened to be talking to an editor, and the editor was like, hmm, there's, there's some interesting questions that you're posing. And there became this moment where I just thought, wow, maybe, I'm, maybe I might want to go back to university. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem. It was just like, this might be something that could be interesting. Maybe I could go play with some more tools. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's what I did. So uh, I, I, came, I came back to, into academia 
uh, which is which is amusing to me because people I talk to now are like, yes, you were always an academic. I'm sure you were an academic from four and you did stuff. I'm like, no, I have had loads of different careers, including being a public school teacher. Um, and I and I love them all. Um, but there was something that I wanted to do in academia. And there was something that um, uh, I, I could feel a purpose for me coming back into it. Um, now, you may have your own journeys in terms of you might want to continue to go straight in. You might want to uh, find other blisses in lots of other spaces. Um, I think all of that is very, very valid um, in terms of uh, how you find your own purpose. Um, essentially, exactly what I did. When I came into academia, there were two really key things for me um, uh, that were central. The first one was finding my village. Um, and the second one was finding my purpose. Um, now, on the finding my village thing, I've been doing that since I started, uh, since I since I first started working on my PhD. And part of that was who are the people that are going to surround me? Um, uh, in theory, you know, it's your supervisor. It could be the people in your program, but they don't have to be. It could be people not even directly related to where you're at uh, studying, um, because it's the people who are going to ground you. It's the people who are going to nurture you. They're going to feed your soul. They're going to listen to you gripe. They're going to build you up when you feel um, demoralized about things, or, or or they're going to laugh with you when you when you realize how ludicrous the world can be at times. It's that village that can sustain you across everything that you're ultimately could be doing. And, and I will say I've had villages, I've had lots of different villages, and those villages have been essential to what I've been able to do. Um, so now, you know, I've led research centers, I've had um, research teams of, 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 of 35, you know, sometimes 50 people, I've worked with community researchers, um, I've had tons of postdocs, I've trained people, I've also tried to think very differently about what it means to ultimately do this work. Um, uh, well-funded by from EPSRC to AHRC to ESRC to Ar Arts Council England. These are all different types of funding bodies. Um, but what was fundamental to being able to have a portfolio um, for me and being able to be successful with what I was able to do and, and the world I was able to build was that second part, was finding my purpose. Um, and I have, I, I, I'm emphatic about this is that my purpose uh, that I realize is that I am to be of service. I, I mean, and, and it, 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 sounds, it sounds grand, but, um, and yes, it, it, you know, there's the fundamental of discovery, there's the questions about kind of knowledge, there's the information about training and mentoring and working with, per, uh, with others, but I have really believed that I am to be of service to, 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 uh, to others. And I, and I can choose what that service looks like, and I can choose what that, what, what that work looks like. But there is something important for me to use my privilege in a way that benefits the world um, and, and ultimately starts to reckon with those sets of tensions and those, those, that little black girl growing up where people didn't think that she was going to be able to go to school um, or to be successful. Those, that's my purpose. I am, I am purposely trying to work where we don't have marginalization and we don't have hierarchies of difference and we don't have um, a, a, a world where people's futures are cons uh, constrained or, or, or negated, right? That's, that's my purpose. Um, and having that purpose means that I can turn to my research or I can turn to my, 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 the work that I'm doing or the collaborations that I build with a real understanding of the intentions that live behind them. Um, and, I can, and I can actually start to try to practice that. So how do you practice living in a, in, a, in a world where you don't want hierarchy, right? How do you practice bringing people together and listening with all of your being to, to uh, concerns and questions? How do, you, how do you knit various different institutions together and bring people together in a way that recognizes that difference that isn't a bad word um, in terms of some places are more public facing, some are private, um, some are some are community based, some are community focused. This is these aren't bad things, um, but ultimately you want to get rid of the tensions between these sets, right? So that ultimately people can actually value each other um, and value those sense of connections and value the coming together. Um, and and I you know and and it has been an art of actually trying to 
turn that purpose into a way of working as a researcher. Um, and that isn't just what is my methodology and can I articulate essentially what, what, the, what the outcome is of, of my findings. It's literally trying to redo that work in different ways. Um, a standard application, or if you're writing your CV, you can be told that these need to have a certain set of structure and a certain set of purpose. And I remember it, a massive epi epiphany for me was talking to uh, someone that I, I, that I imminently respected about, about a CV. And I said, you know, I do all of this community work. I do all of this interaction with these various different groups. And, and, I, and, I, and I really listen to the communities in, in really important ways. And I said, you know, I don't feel like I capture that in a, in a CV. The CV is really interested in these other sets of things. And she said, it doesn't have to be. It's yours, right? It is your, your, your take, your understanding of who you are, your ability to try to capture and to, and to give language to that. And I started intentionally doing that then. I started writing a, a bit of a paragraph at the beginning of my CV to really put that purpose and intention front and center. I started really changing the way that I narrativize or talked about that purpose that I had and how that went, went into all the different types of projects that I, that I was involved in. Um, and more importantly, I started to understand myself as a researcher. This is actually probably the most crucial part. It's not just what you study. It's not just what you investigate. It's not just what you examine, but who do you, how do you do that? Who are you in ultimately starting to think? Now go back to the little black girl, right? Well, I realized my superpower was, was patterns and systems. And, and, and once, I, once I understood that, it meant that from a research perspective, I could talk about what I could do to anybody. So suddenly now, anyone who does systems analysis can understand it, a bioinformatician can understand it, a statistician can understand it, anyone who does physiology can understand it, because it's a, these are all lots of mechanisms, right? Um, and I, I, it was almost as if I found the translator's code. Uh, because uh, suddenly I could talk methods with a whole different set of people who unfortunately have been taught that their methods are completely different than anyone else's methods that is ever interested in anything that is about systems. Now, this is not to recognize that there aren't disciplinary differences. We need them um, and they are useful. Um, but because I was so committed to the interdisciplinary work um, and also these, these connections across spaces, um, my superpower of being able to listen and reflect and learn has actually been beneficial for me as a researcher. So it's meant that I work with computer scientists, I work with, I work with chemists, I work with engineers, I work with um, archivists and, art, and artists and, and uh, curators um, uh, because ultimately I value their language and their contribution. But, they, but I'm also able to talk about mine in a way that is, um, uh, can permeate um, uh, in those sorts of disciplinary spaces. Also, more importantly, out in the community. Um, to people who have no idea what some of this stuff might be and may not really care um, uh, or they care deeply because they're connected to it, but they don't know necessarily the disciplinary language that might be attached to it. Um, and that kind of translational work is very important to who I am, what I do. Um, so I'm hopeful, um, as I said, that what I have covered gives you a, a little bit of inspiration um, I'm hopeful that what I've covered gives you a little bit of purpose. Um, and I hope it kind of sets you up to start asking some questions of yourself. What is your purpose, right? What, what is that? If you were able to articulate that and kind of sit down with it in a quiet, nice space, what is that purpose? What, what can you articulate that and find that? Where is your village? Where is that space and that, 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 that group that you turn to, that can nurture you, that can, can give you the vitality that you need to be able to uh, sometimes withstand, you know, huge, huge storms um, in terms of trying to just live, right? Much less trying to live with purpose and, and, with, and, and with clarity and with grace um, with, within, within research um, and, and academia. Um, and I think, you know, recognizing that your villages might flux and change as your lives change, as you move to different locations, um, is absolutely perfectly okay for you to find new villages um, and to hold on to some other ones because they're so crucially important to what you are doing. Um, and, I, and I think that probably the, the, the kind of more critical one is who are you as a researcher? You know what you do, 
you know what your interests are, you know what the, the sort of things that motivate you, but who, who is that fundamentally? Um, and once you start to figure that out, you can go, am I a facilitator? Do I really want to facilitate conversations? Um, are, you, are you a person that really, really enjoys um, bringing people with you and kind of le leading as a, as a, as a, as a combined leader? Um, and that's really hard within a space with which there are PIs and there's a singular person and there's this, there's this notion that there should be this, 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 this sort of, you know, epicenter. And I, 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 I really embrace um, what uh, those within the, the movement for Black Lives refer to as leaderful, right? That we are leaderful. We are full of leaders that are around us. Um, and so I try to lead from that perspective. Uh, of being of being a space where I am I am joined by other leaders as opposed to I am the single one um, and that isn't to critique Donna and talking about me being a leading voice or whatever it might be um, but but I recognize that there are so many contributions from others um, and I sit I sit on the shoulders of giants um, and some people that no one has ever met before um, because they've either uh, birthed me into existence. Um, uh, literally, or or they or they are, they are able to support me um, when times are hard, or or when times are are quiet, um, uh, or when or when times are busy, um, uh, and can um, uh, or, or or try to, or, or it tries to to slow uh, slow me up, um, uh, or 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 trip me up is the is the better phrase. Um, so I'm 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 hopeful that what you've got is a bit of space. Um, because I, I can expect this particular time period in this particular moment, um, uh, which, which for some is, is a continuation of past moments of, of crises and, and challenges, either health or mental health or, or, just, or just trying to, to, to stay the course, um, whatever that course might be for you. I hope you can take a little bit of time um, to just sort of invest in yourself. Um, and think about some of the things that uh, I've, I've talked through in my world. Um, and, and maybe we can have a little bit more of a conversation uh, for the next little while um, as we start to think about, well, what does that mean in practice? Um, how could you do some of that? And uh, what are the places that might be able to help support you? So thank you all very much um, for your time. And, uh, and I look forward to the questions and the conversation. Karen, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I've been smiling you know, since you talked about your first superpower and you, you went through three or four different superpowers and I absolutely love that. I've, um, we've got a lot of our Polar Horizons students uh, online listening today and uh, they've just been going crazy. Um, this is exactly the sort of inspiration but also direction that we're looking to give these students who in this particularly tough time are trying to navigate research in academia and and stem and you know their own superpowers so thank you so much i loved about finding your village and about finding your purpose um, i think they're so critical in making sure we are strong as ourselves as we just work as because work is work and life is life but work is dominating in this period of a lot of these people's lives at the moment. Um, one of our great questions we've already got is, when did you realise your purpose? Was it innate from childhood or did, you, did it become more clear as a consequence of your experience and journey? Oh, really good question. Um, I think, so if I'm, if I'm really honest, uh, I spent a lot um, and I think, I think the bumbling around was probably helpful, um, where I wasn't 100% sure what my purpose was. And, um, uh, and, and, I, and I, I, I definitely folded in presumptions of what my purpose should be. So other people's assumptions of what my purpose should be, uh, or other groups' presump presumption of what that might look like. Um, and I tried on different outfits, if, if, if that metaphor might work, um, trying to think, you know, not, not necessarily trying to blend in, because it's, it's just, it's hopeless trying to do the blending for me normally. Um, uh, uh, well, just a bit too honorary and a bit too honest uh, to, do, to do too much blending. Um, 
but uh, so I tried on different outfits trying to see did that work did that work did this thing kind of work um, and and I probably needed to do a little bit of that um, to become very clear that I didn't want to wear those clothes I didn't want to wear those those kind of outfits that they didn't fit me um, and they didn't uh, and and I and I and I had to do a lot of work to realize that that not fitting me did not make me a bad person or, or, or somehow a person that has failed or, or, or has something wrong with them. I didn't need to change is essentially the, the point. Um, and, I didn't, and I didn't need to do anything else other than say, I don't, that, I don't want that and I don't want to be, I don't want to look like that or, or wear that or to carve myself into that. If you want to do that, more power to you, but I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, and, and I needed to do, I needed to have confidence in that. That took time. That took time to have that confidence to go, there is another way of doing this. I don't know what it is yet, but this isn't it. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then to keep trialing out what was going to fit me um, so that I started trying on different outfits. I started taking off different things. I started putting patches on stuff and I was like, huh, these all are fitting a little bit better. They're not quite right yet but they're feeling a bit better. Um, and the minute I started uh, kind of working my way through this, the clarity kind of happened. Um, and I had a couple of different moments of this clarity. So uh, some of my original uh, sort of funding, the, the original funding that I received was institutional funding, um, quite small scale, but it allowed me to, to go to different sites to do some research and to collaborate with some particular kind of partners. And so I'm, I'm writing these, these sorts of these grants in a way that was like, you know, this application and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I realized as I was doing this, it's sort of like, it felt like I was almost parroting somebody else, like this out of body experience. Um, and it, and it, didn't, it didn't really capture who I was as a researcher. It didn't really capture the purpose. I mean, the, the, everything was essentially kind of wrong with it. Um, I still got funded. So it's, it's not as if it was like horrific. Um, but, it, but, it, but I could tell in the act of actually creating it and putting it together that it, that it, that it wasn't really capturing what, I, who, what that purpose was. Um, and, and, and I think it's, you know, there is something about trying to, um, we get a lot of positive, uh, 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 not quite false positives, but we get, we get a lot of reinforcements of certain sets of behaviors within, within the kind of research world. Um, and, and so the presumption of if you write an application and it's, and it's successful, the presumption of the behavior is you keep doing that, you write, you got the formula and you write it exactly like that, or you do some version of that and you will continue to be successful. But I, I just felt like this wasn't really me or my purpose or who I was as a researcher. Um, so I took the choice to start trying to actually find that voice. And, um, and I, I submitted, I was a part of a couple of big consortia bids, uh, one that wasn't successful, um, one that didn't uh, get further. Um, and then I wrote my first really big grant. Um, that was me. That was probably more me than, I, than it had ever been before in terms of really trying to capture you know, the intentionality, how to work, how to think about ideas, how to really describe that from a methodological perspective. Um, I didn't get funded in that situation, but, um, but, but the people I had brought together and the people who had reviewed it and the interactions could, you know, they helpfully helped me recognize that I said they saw, they saw something quite specific in that, that I could start to say, this is me, right? Like, this is me. Um, and I, 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 and I, have a, I have a fairly good track record now. Um, uh, in terms of getting funding at, at really quite large levels uh, and, and even at, at smaller levels. Um, but I have really made it a mission of mine, continuing to write different bids to, to make sure that I, I, I am present in those as a researcher. And I am present with those, in those uh, with my purpose. And I, and I don't shy away from it. Um, and, 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 and in fact, it's part of the superpower of how I think and, and navigate um, really critical, challenging problems. Um, so why would I? Why would you want to hide that, right, under under a bushel? If that if that if that if that is actually core of of, of what I do now, there was I needed to learn how to um, communicate that. I think to lots of different people and to do it in a way that um, can can bring people along with me. 
Um, so that, that's been an ongoing growth. And, um, and, and I, I really do try to learn from all of my experiences all the time and not think I'm done with learning because I might be a certain age. Um, uh, and that, cause that's just ridiculous um, to imagine that. So it's, it's an ongoing period of reflection. That's an excellent answer. Thank you. Um, I think it does tie into, we've got a great question. As you put on those different costumes and cloaks and as you moved into different spaces and different roles, um, how have you protected yourself as you entered into those new roles? So have you been able to take your full self into that situation? And what advice would you give others who are feeling alienated despite their knowledge and expertise as they step into uncomfortable space? Yeah, um, a, a, a really a crucial question. And, um, and I, you know, uh, I, I, this is probably a longer conversation, but, but I, uh, I'd say three, 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 three quick things come to me. I think the first one, um, and I think it's a healthy one, but I think there's, I think there is a real key question for everybody of, um, do you want to be there? And I, and I, and again, I, I, I think, I think, you know, not asking that question is, um, is, uh, is not doing ourselves good service uh, to, to really ask, do you want to be there? And it doesn't necessarily have to be the existential being there. It could be that particular place um, or that um, uh, and we can and we can think differently about because um, uh, because if you do want to be there, the the question then is is um, uh, what what is it about that place that ultimately um, attracts you? Is it the is it the research? Is it the community? Is it the knowledge that is there? Is it where it can lead you? Is it is it you know really trying to start to think that stuff through about, well, what is it that is the, the positive um, and what is the, the place that, that really motivates you? And then if you can, maximizing that. If some place is really critical for you because of the community that surrounds that place or the community that's in it, then by golly, surround yourself with community every moment that you can, right? As opposed to necessarily spending as much time as possible in the stuff that really drives you just not happy right about the location and then the thing that you need to feed your soul you give yourself that much of it and then you're actually getting that much of the other stuff right and so i think if, if you've got it as your capacity you know try to flip that script as much as you can so that you can ultimately start to get that pleasure back into um into the into the why you've chosen to want to be there um, uh, as much as you can and this that you don't we, we don't we all don't have magic powers to just be able to make it happen um, uh, but I do think you know surrounding yourself with that village that might become really quite key then and you might need to have that village really close and you might need to be really critical about who that village is um, so uh, uh, you know this is for another day but there are many places that I, I interact in from Whitehall uh, uh, and parts of government all the way through to uh, university settings where people think I'm, I'm either the cleaner, which is a perfectly legit and lovely job, um, uh, or I'm a visitor, right? And, um, uh, and, I, and, you know, and I, I, I have actually made it my, my purpose, actually, in many of the jobs and, and locations that I've had to, to know those invisible people often their labor can be quite invisible um, in in many spaces um so uh so there they are folks they are part of my village so that every day i will go and seek uh, uh some individuals out and i will check in with them they will check in with me um there's a particular woman and and the space i interact with now uh quite a bit um who's always singing and so when she sees me she sings certain songs to me and it's just it's so pleasurable um, and, and it's nothing to do with, with, with work, really. It's not necessarily something about submitting something or it's, it's nothing about that. But it is, it is the most magical, important thing to be able to have my day started, being able to interact around her. Why wouldn't I do that, right? Why would I start my day by jumping into emails or having people yell at me or something that is just like, that is so unpleasurable. I could do that. I could start my day with like, I got to get to work. 
Whereas I start my day with like, I want to listen to the lovely lady that sings to me because that's just awesome, right? Um, and again, I'm flipping the script because it's not that I'm not going to get to work, but I, I know what will feed my soul and to, and to help me feel grounded in those spaces. Um, and that, that's where I'm saying, you know, you cultivate those relationships, you build them in terms of bringing that village as close to you as you possibly can. Um, and, then, and then you do the self-care. Oh my gosh, you do the self-care. You, you do the stopping working at particular times. You do the walking away. If, you, if walks in the woods work or the mountains or a spa treatment, I don't care what it is, whatever it is that, is, that gives you that bliss. Some, some people like reading, some might, might, just, might just, you know, a good coffee, whatever that is, you just, you need to put it in your agenda and you need to maximize doing it. Um, uh, because those are the types of things that will, will just keep you knitted, right? They just keep you knitted in a way that's just uh, extremely important because the challenges aren't going to magically go away um, and, and those spaces aren't going to magically transform themselves um, uh, to be ones that are just easy to navigate. But you can, and if you can, not, that not everyone can, but if you can, choose how you associate and choose how you build around you. Um, and purposely build around you joy. I mean, just purposely do it. Um, because if, when you purposely build with joy around you, it's a lot harder for the gross stuff to stick to all that joy, right? But if you, are, if you got a lot of gross stuff around you, gross stuff just attracts more gross stuff. And you're just feeling like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is just insurmountable. Um, whereas if you can feel, find the joy somewhere, you just, you just, keep, you just keep bringing it up. Um, and maybe you gotta you gotta fake it for a little bit until until it feels a bit bit more like 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 you know how to do this. Um, but you just but you treat it you treat it as as seriously as you need to, um, depending upon the circumstances that you're that you're dealing with. That's an excellent answer as well. Thank you very much. Um, related to that, so specifically, a lot of our early career researchers are dealing with rejections from when they're doing the applications from funders and grants and things. So if you feel like you really, you found your village and you're working towards finding your purpose, how do you learn to improve on those funding bids, either technically or, or with that purpose and passion? Yeah, really good question. Um, uh, I mean, again, there's lots of different kind of air answers depending upon what, where, the, where the crunchy parts are, are for it. Um, so let's, let's, say, let's say part of it is that the language is weird or the process is strange or the, um, the, you know, you're really good at telling somebody what your idea is, but when you start trying to write it down, it, it gets all complicated or it, gets, or it loses its juice uh, or whatever it might be. Um, and, and I do think there's a translational issue about going from if you're, if you're a visual person or if you use slides or you, or you, or you tell stories. I'm a storyteller at heart. So I tell stories um, uh, to usually convey lots of things, but it's an art to try to write in storytelling mode that isn't a story. Like when you try to write a grant or you try to write a book or you're writing an article, uh, you know, so I still see that in story mode. Um, I don't tell people that, but I still see it in acts. I still see it, I see it in structure. Again, I'm a systems person, right? So I, I can break it down in a way that I can start to put the pieces together um, and, uh, and start to see, and to see the connections. Um, and then I have to really realize sometimes that other people may not be able to see all the connections that I can. And, th and that's the difference when you can see patterns. Uh, so I can vary uh, geometry, going back to the little black girl again, right? I, I would get so many things wrong in geometry, uh, in my geometry class, because I could see the pattern to go from here to here. And then, and then my geometry teacher was like, I need all the stuff in the middle. And I'm like, why do you need the stuff in the middle? I already know where the logic is gonna take me. I, I can go from here to here. I don't need the stuff in the middle because I can, I can glue that and I'm, and I'm comfortable with the gluing because I know what it looks like. So there are lots of ideas that are like that, where people have the stuff here and they got the stuff here and it's either fuzzy or it's irrelevant. Um, and sometimes it's the middle in between. Um, and there's an art to figure out how much of that stuff in the middle is crucial, how much of it is you going down a rabbit hole and you're just like, you know, completely obsessed with this little tiny thing and nobody else in the universe is but you, but it's lovely. Um, and how much of that is actually fundamental 
to helping people get from here to here, right? It's not just to show your work. It's also like, you got to help the gluing. Um, and I call it topping and tailing. So that there's lots of stuff that just needs topping and tailing. It's not that it's wrong or it, it's, it's problematic, but it just needs to be topped off with a little bit of something and it needs something at the tail. It just needs a, it needs a little bit at that, at that end point just to help somebody get to the next bit. Um, and I, I will say that uh, oh, loads of grants that I have reviewed uh, and, and applications for all sorts of different things, sometimes it's literally just the glue. It's not, it's not something fundamental that's problematic. It's about the glue. And the better you get at figuring out how to glue stuff together, um, the, the, the better you can sharpen some of that up because that's usually quite easy. Um, for some folks, there are some fundamental things about what they're discovering. And they've got to figure out either they're charting into uncharted territory or they're moving into spaces where there's a lot of tension around a, a topic and there are camps. Um, and those camps are really entrenched about the view this way or the view that way or whatever that might be. And you've got to figure out how, what's your, you know, again, back to your purpose and who you are as a researcher. If you want to play in that ball game, what is, what do you want to do? Do you want to try to unify these camps around your new idea? Do you want to side with one or the other? Do you want to um, helpfully help people think differently about something completely and move them away from the camped approach? Well, if you're going to do that, you need to strategize, right? You got to strategize about how to tell that story um, because the, the, your disciplines might be quite entrenched with where they are about talking about stuff. So then you've got to figure out, okay, how do I navigate this? How do I tell this story in a way where people won't reject it or love it or hate it or put it into boxes because of their own presumptions about the discipline. This isn't about the individual. This is about the discipline or about the subject area. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the key for me about writing grants is to write them. I mean, and, and literally, it, it, it is. It is literally to write them. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's, that's easier said than done, but you get better at it the more you do it. Um, and so if you only do one a year, you know, you, that one a year, it has to, it needs, it needs fairy dust, it needs love, it needs prayer, it needs everything on it to magically make it always be fundable. Because uh, sometimes it's fundable, but there's not enough funding, right? So it, it, you increase your odds if you might write more of them, but you need to write them with the same level of like attention to absolute every bit of detail and all of that bit of glue. Because if you're just turning them out in a six week pattern and you're not learning anything and you're not adding what you're learning into the development of yourself as a writer and as a thinker and as a creator, you're, you're literally just making more you know, recycling. Um, uh, because you're just not doing the growth that is needed, because uh, that's essential for, for some of this, is, is how to grow. Now, some of it is we need to put pressure on our systems to recognize the creative brilliance that people bring. So it's not always just about the growth, it's also about the system. Um, but, but I think this is a, this is a bit of a two-way street that we can, we, can, we, we can put pressure on the system, but we also have to start asking ourselves who we are as a researcher. Um, and not just necessarily being satisfied because we got funded and, and therefore we're done. We don't have to do any of the deep thinking about what, of, about, about what the work is, because that's the part where it just, you know, we're trying to keep it exciting for ourselves. Um, uh, and, and that dynamism is, is really key. Excellent. Oh, that's very good. That will help a lot of our early career researchers as well as others, I think. Um, I will... Uh, so, so, so Donna, one second. Uh, yep. Let me just add one more thing for, yep. for, for those who are starting out. Um, uh, you can, in certain situations, get access to successful applications, um, depending upon where you're based or what institutions. They can anonymize people's names. They can anonymize the name of the project. But in your fields or your areas, they can give you an example of what an, a successful application looks like. Um, and that can just give you, for, for those where this language is a bit odd or the structure is a bit strange or it's very different than, than how your discipline normally writes, um, you can look at one and then just treat it like a, treat it like a template. You know, what, what is, break it down. What's the structure that these look like? Recognize that uh, people have their own footprint on their grants. They look like them, if you will, um, in the sense of how they talk and how they think. So you don't want to start putting on clothes that don't match you, right? Um, but if, it, if it's something about the mechanics of it, 
you can start you can start breaking that down so it's not um, a, an unknown to you. You can start to understand what these components are, and you can start understanding the differences between some of the parts of it. Um, and you can treat that as an exercise, and then you can make your own little village where you actually share work with each other, and you actually read each other's work and give each other criticism and advice. Um, I have been nurtured at many different times with a really tight set of people where we shared writing and we shared grant ideas um, uh, and they, they, they were able to challenge me to be better. Um, uh, and I still have that even now where I test out ideas with people um, who are trusted friends. That's a fantastic key element, I think, for everyone going forward. I'm just going to tap into the, you, you said we have to put pressure on systems. So a lot of us are doing a lot of work and energy at the moment in the current system doesn't seem to let us attract diverse talent into STEM and into academia and into postdocs in the UK. I was just wondering if you had uh, suggestions for us of how we could get more people from the different villages, from the different um, walks of life and how we can get them into this current world of research. Yeah, um, yeah, and I think this is a this is a longer conversation. Um, uh, you know, maybe it was some good food, uh, and we can we can we can solve the world uh, potentially all together. Um, but but I think I think one you know one of the things that is really okay. I've got about five things going on in my head at the same time. So the first one is to is going back to that little black girl and working in the back of that room, right? Like. If we're if we're in systems that are not recognizing that I, I have actually finished the book, <laughs> and there there is and there needs to be something else now, um, but instead uh, uh, is keeping me in the back of the class working in a box uh, of math problems. You know we've we've got we've got some problematics uh, when it comes to seeing the capabilities and the creativity and the excitement um, for, for all of our young people. I mean, I, I strongly believe we, we, need, we need to be better at that um, fundamentally. So it's not necessarily just STEM or where you're at or careers or, or your PhD or trying, you know, postdoc. It's literally being able to see the brilliance of people in all walks of life at all times um, and, to, and, to, and to nurture that um, uh, and, to, and to nurture that seriously. Um, so I think I think for me that's that's one of the fundamentals, um, including the you know the problematic that we have uh, across across most of research and innovation of, of of choosing who who do we decide to count as a researcher, um, and that that that's often a very narrow set of of parameters around around who those individuals might be. Um, one of my research projects worked with uh, a, a large group of community researchers, um, who for us were just researchers. Um, and, and, and what was really interesting about talking to them about some of the fundamentals of doing the kind of research that we were interested in, I asked them, did they gossip? Um, and, and people are like, oh, no, no, no. And then eventually somebody was like, yeah, well, I actually know all the details of everybody that lives around me. I know who's had a baby. I know who's in a relationship. I know who's, whose person in, in their family is, is ill, who needs food that needs to come to them. So suddenly what they had started to do was they were doing the systems mapping, right? They were really able to recognize um, all the networks that had existed across different sets of people, and they were coming up with interventions to be able to help different sets of folks. So the minute I started explaining, you got all the skills that you're going to need to be able to do this research work because you've got a lot of things that you've already exercised, like you've got these muscles already. So here's some extra stuff for you to kind of think about. And they were just they were blown away because for them academia or universities or knowledge or this sort of stuff was stuff you got in a book and you needed to go to uni and it had all this stuff and because they didn't have it they didn't have any of it right they had already counted themselves out as being able to actively contribute and participate um and so it wasn't for them it wasn't something that they could do and it, and they would not add value whereas i was like it, you know starting from the premise of of course you are going to add value uh, because you're you, and then more importantly, you actually already have skills. 
you're navigating the world every day and decoding really often quite complicated social or racial situations and you're and you're figuring out how to proceed you if you've got those sets of skills much less the ability to to do certain sets of analysis or to or to walk into a field and be able to tell me the different sets of species that are there or to know what to eat i mean you know i mean th this is a, this is really impressive work right and we and when we change the way we value that i think we can we can do stuff to bring far more people into various different spaces because we're not bringing them into spaces that are now you know the the connections have to look a certain way it's back to the clothes again right I'm all for bringing more people into loads of different spaces, but not if I'm going to force them to wear certain clothes, right? And say that it, this thing only looks like this and it only works like this and therefore put on this straight jacket. Um, I want to be able to expand what that world looks like so we can bring everybody's knowledge into that space and, and ultimately value all different sets of people's contribution. Um, because that seems to me where we can get to a magical space, right? Where, where, where there is a fundamental acknowledgement that, that this is a world for us and by us all, um, as opposed to a, a special set of people. Um, and, and you have to do a special set of things. Now, there are skills we might want to impart. And there's different sets of knowledges that we might want to to um, um, you know gather around us, um, and that's that's that. I, but I, I think that lives, needs to live on top of the other stuff. Um, uh, and if we can get some of that fundamental right, I think we can really transform the permeability, the porosity, the movement of people across multiple fields um, and disciplines. Oh, that's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. I think this should be a series of talks. I don't think we're happy with you just doing one talk. Uh, as you said, we could sit <laughs> down on any of these and, and really just, you know, have hours yep. of, of chat. Um, there's a lot of people who want to move diversity and inclusion forward. Uh, it's very clear that we are, it's a huge benefit that you are in this space in the UK and working to do that for us and with us and I thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk today and we do look forward to speaking to you again. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And to all the people that I, I can't see, I know you're there. Um, I, you know, I, I, give, give, give yourself a hug. Um, uh, you know, do whatever you can to just make sure you realize that you're phenomenal. Right. Just in, and if you need to tell it to yourself in the mirror every day, you do that. Um, and, and we are we are grateful for your your presence and your continued um, uh, activism uh, and interaction. So um, uh, I want to thank all of you uh, uh, for for giving me the time. Thank you, Karen. Thank, thank you so much. So I think that concludes the talk. I'll stop recording and we'll end here. Thank you so much, Karen. You're very welcome. Thanks, everybody.